All right, let's begin our class, Galatians uh, for Beginners. This is lesson number four in the series, entitled Paul's Conversion and Commission. And we'll be covering Galatians chapter one, verse 10, to chapter two, verse 10, in the epistle to the Galatians. Uh, as we have noted before in this epistle, Paul is uh, rebuking those who are teaching a gospel different than the gospel that he and the other apostles originally delivered to these churches uh, in the province of Galatia. Um, uh, the people who had entered into these churches that were causing the problem uh, taught that the true gospel included not only faith in Jesus Christ and baptism as, a, as an expression of that faith, but also full adherence to the Jewish law and custom fully uh, accepted in the rite of circumcision. And so these false teachers were accusing Paul of uh, toning down the demands of what they call the true gospel, which included circumcision in their view, uh, that Paul was doing this in order to gain favor with Gentiles, in order to make the gospel more palatable to Gentiles. The argument, their argument was, that in his zeal and ambition to build churches among the Gentiles, Paul had stripped the gospel of some of its uh, uh, basic teachings. And they were contending that one of the teachings of the gospel was that a person had to be circumcised uh, before being uh, baptized. Uh, and they said that their teachings were in accord with what was actually taught in Jerusalem, the original church, the first church that wasn't exactly the headquarters, but certainly it was a church that had a lot of influence where the apostles were, that was their claim. We've got the true gospel, okay? So the Judaizers uh, came to Galatia uh, in that region in order to restore the gospel to its true content. They were like uh, restorationists, uh, if you wish, of that era. Their plan was first to discredit Paul and then to substitute what they taught for what he had originally taught uh, to, these, uh, to these churches. Now their plan was succeeding, that's the problem. And so Paul writes this urgent letter, this epistle to the Galatians, uh, denouncing the Judaizers, that's uh, these teachers, they were called the Judaizers, and uh, in his letter reconfirming that the gospel that he gave them was the only true gospel and that anyone who taught anything else should be cursed, so very strong language that he uses to denounce these uh, teachers. Now this background explains why he says, and we'll be reading that in verse 10, that he's not trying to please men. In other words, his gospel, his message of the gospel was not designed to please men. And his language concerning the Judaizers in this letter was not the kind of language used to please men, but he was speaking as a servant of Christ. I'm not out here to please anyone, you know, he's saying. Certainly not trying to please the Gentiles by you know, toning down the gospel. Certainly not trying to win favor with the Judaizers. No, I'm standing up to them and I'm, I'm cursing them what, for what they're doing. So Paul responds to accusations that his gospel is not the same as the other apostles, he gives three replies to this. First of all, he says the fact that he received the gospel from Christ himself and not secondhand from other apostles. So he's not teaching you know, the gospel taught by another apostle. He's saying, hey, what I'm teaching, I received from Christ himself. Secondly, that the other apostles fully acknowledged Paul's gospel. In other words, they agreed that what he was teaching was actually true and correct. And then thirdly, that on one occasion he was obliged to correct Peter the apostle himself regarding this very point of uh, liberty from the law and that Peter accepted the correction. And again, we'll, we'll uh, be reading this. As far as the Galatians and Judaizers were concerned, if Paul and Peter agreed on the substance of the gospel, that should have, you know, that should have settled it. So all the replies uh, uh, are tied in, if you wish, with his meeting with uh, Peter. 
All right? And that's why it was important. We went over this uh, last time, you know, the, the three meetings that he had with Peter. The, 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 the message between the lines, all the time I met with Peter, and Peter is an apostle that you have high regard for. Peter never challenged my gospel, and Peter never said anything about what I was teaching, that it was incorrect or that it was false. All right? That's the point that Paul is getting across as he talks about his meetings with Peter. Uh, with Peter. Okay, so we'll uh, read the text now a little more closely uh, in chapter one, beginning in verse uh, 11. So in here, Paul begins by explaining that the gospel that he preached to them was originally received by him from Jesus himself, and then later confirmed by Peter, Jesus' chosen apostle, at their first meeting in Jerusalem. So let's read chapter one, verse 11 and 12. He says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So here Paul refers to the gospel, you know, the content of the gospel, the response to the gospel, that he originally preached to them, was not taught to him by man, but came to him as a revelation from God Himself. Um, he knew about Jesus, I mean Paul knew about Jesus because he was a Jew in Jerusalem and you couldn't avoid knowing about Jesus. Um, he met Jesus in a miraculous way on the road to Damascus. He obeyed Jesus just like everybody else by being baptized. And he received the ability to know and teach accurately all the things that Christ taught in the same way that the apostles did through the power of the Holy Spirit given to him by Christ. Uh, John talks about that in John chapter 16, verse 13. So let's continue reading chapter 1, verse uh, 13 and 14. He says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral uh, traditions. So Paul explains his own conversion here. He persecuted the church, he says, and he did so beyond measure. In other words, he was fanatical about this persecution. He was an extremist, not only limiting the growth of the church, he wanted to destroy the church. He wanted to destroy this, this Christianity thing. The reason for this fanaticism is that he was raised to be a strict Pharisee. He was zealous for the tradition. Let me explain to you a little bit about the tradition here. The rabbis had created a series of 613 human commandments which they built around the law as a kind of a hedge, if you wish, to protect the purity of the law. And the Pharisees, they were the guardians of these human commandments or these traditions, if you wish. For example, the law said, no work on the Sabbath. That's what the law said. The rabbis created a, a number of rules to protect this command. Rules such as a prohibition uh, against walking a certain distance. So on the Sabbath, if you walked a certain distance, you know, beyond that certain distance, uh, uh, you, you, were, you, were breaking, uh, you were breaking the law. Or the prohibition of a scribe. A scribe, uh, one who copied the law, a lawyer, uh, couldn't carry his pens, his, his tools, if you wish, uh, on the Sabbath. That was considered uh, work. So these were the kind of rules, man-made rules, that were built, if you wish, around the law to protect people from actually breaking the law. Right? So Paul, the zealous Pharisee, was so against Christianity because the church meant death to Phariseeism. You know, Paul saw the crown of Judaism in the traditions which he fought to preserve and he knew that if, if Jews became Christians they might keep parts of the Mosaic law you know, against adultery or murder or stealing which were confirmed by Jesus, but they would quickly do away with the burdensome traditions which Christianity freed them from. So the Judaizers were merely Jewish Pharisees who had become Christians, who wanted to impose things on Christianity in the same way that they were imposed on Judaism. So it was just a new form of traditions, if you wish. Okay? So their starting point was circumcision, but they would have added 
you know, from there. So the, 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 the kind of the breaking point, the contact point, the tipping point, if we want to use a more modern term, the tipping point was if they could convince Christians to be circumcised, they could then add all kinds of other things to the tradition and build that same wall, if you wish, build that same hedge around the gospel. Okay? So Paul reminds them that he was the worst of these Pharisees, but now he preaches freedom from these things in Christ. And why? Because of the revelation received from Jesus Christ, since no man could have convinced him. No man could have convinced them that he was wrong. He was such a fanatic. But Jesus appearing to him and being blinded and then being healed miraculously and hearing the gospel and so on and so forth, this changed his mind. So let's keep reading verses 15 to 17. It says, but when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. So in this passage here, Paul refers to both his conversion and his commission in the same context. He's saying God knew from the very beginning of Paul's life that when he was called, he would respond. He didn't force Paul to respond. He just knew, because God knows the future, if you wish, he just knew that when Paul would be called, he knew that Paul would respond. Paul says it was the grace of God expressed in the death of Jesus for sin that Paul responded to. This is what melted his heart. God's purpose for him was to demonstrate the living Christ in the dramatically changed life of Paul. What better way to reach out to the Gentiles than through the transformed life of a fanatical Jew who formerly despised Gentiles? I mean, he was fanatic about you know, destroying the church, but he despised Gentiles. So you can imagine it, converting the guy who, who, who hates Christianity and wants to destroy it, and who also despises Gentiles. Imagine taking this guy, converting him, and sending him to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. So Paul says that when he, this transformation happened to him, he did not consult with the other apostles first but rather went off to Arabia, to the desert, and then returned to Damascus for some time. And we know about that, because last time, remember, we studied a bit of a chronological history of Paul's life and, and ministry. All right, let's keep reading, verse 18. He says, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. Three years later than what? Well, after he was converted, after he was in the desert, went back to his hometown, and so on and so forth. Three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. So only after three years that he actually go to Jerusalem and meet with Peter and James for several weeks. No repudiation or rejection came from them. And if he were not genuine, he would have been revealed as a false apostle right at this time. So remember, what he's doing is he's trying to reestablish or establish his credibility before the church in the face of attacks by these Judaizers. So he says, hey, this is how I was converted. I received the gospel from Jesus himself. I went away for a time of learning and meditation and so on and so forth, maturation. When I met with the apostles, they didn't reject me, they didn't repudiate me, they saw me for who I was and they accepted me for who I was. All right, verse 21 to 14, uh, 24. He says, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. So people didn't know him, he says, you know, by sight. He wasn't well known, but they heard of him, his reputation, what had taken place in his life. This was known, this had spread throughout the brotherhood. So he says, on the contrary, he went into the northern regions of Syria and Cilicia to preach, and other places kept hearing of his success in preaching the gospel in these areas. Now, note that all were glorifying God because of his ministry. 
There was no disapproval by the apostles, and this is his point. From the very beginning, his gospel has not been rejected, but rather encouraged by Peter and the other apostles. So his first reply to their accusations is to refer to the divine source of his gospel. I received the gospel from Jesus. I didn't get a polluted gospel. I didn't get a perverted gospel. I, got the, I received the true gospel from the true source. Now, during the interval between his time in Syria, we know, because of the history, that Paul uh, brought, uh, was brought to Antioch by uh, Barnabas to, uh, to teach. Um, he gathered funds for a relief mission to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he returned with Barnabas and John Mark to the church in Antioch. And the church of Antioch, of course, was the jumping, jumping off place for the missionary journeys, but it was also a place where there were Jews and Gentiles who had converted to Christianity. And it was the first place where these two groups were merged into one body in one uh, congregation. And of course, as I say, uh, in Antioch, when they returned there with John Mark, uh, uh, they had their first, they left for their first missionary journey, and it was during this first missionary journey that these churches in Galatia uh, were established. So he reminds them a little bit of the history, uh, his history, and what took place in his life before he actually came to them to preach the gospel. So the Judaizers begin to uh, cause trouble in these and other churches with their false doctrines and attacks against Paul. Now these events go by in a period, as I said, of 14 years. And now Paul finds himself back in Jerusalem with all of the apostles and the church. So we see what's happened, right? He's been converted, uh, he's had a vision, uh, he receives the gospel and his calling uh, from God. Uh, he disappears for, uh, well, disappears is a hard word, but he, you know, he goes into seclusion, into the desert. He goes back home. He's preaching in his region. Then he's involved in teaching in Antioch. Uh, he, he does uh, some benevolence work to Jerusalem. He meets with Peter. All these things are, 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 are happening. And, and then he goes on his first missionary journey, establishes these churches in Galatia. And then after that, the trouble begins. The Judaizers say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, this guy's preaching things and uh, you know, uh, these, these people are not being circumcised. Uh, remember what I told you last time, right? The Judaizers, they wanted, they were Jews. The Messiah was a Jew. He was their Messiah. And they saw themselves losing influence in the church. Uh, they saw that their cultural heritage uh, did not matter as far as Christianity was concerned. If a Gentile could be a Christian, uh, without any relationship, without any reference to their cultural history. You know, their idea, well, just anybody can become a Christian. What? That's not right. You see what I'm saying? You see what was driving this? The, the, we understand the theological idea, you know, circumcision, baptism, but the cultural and emotional thing that was driving this has to be considered, um, has to be considered as well. So Paul in Galatians chapter two, verses one to 10, is describing what Luke, is, what Luke talks about in Acts chapter 15, and that's the, what they call the Jerusalem Council. So all these things have happened, he's planted the churches, the Judaizers are causing problems, and now Paul finds himself back in Jerusalem. He returns from his first missionary journey, and he's reporting in Antioch the things that have been done. Then the Judaizers begin to debate with them at that place. And so the church sends them down to Jerusalem to get an opinion from the apostles and the elders at the church in Jerusalem. And so Paul and Barnabas and Titus and others, they go down to Jerusalem to settle the matter. They report their work to the church in Jerusalem and during that time, the Judaizers again challenge them openly. All right, in front of the apostles. The apostles and elders then gather together with Paul and Barnabas and the Judaizers to examine this matter, to discuss it. The outcome was that the apostles and elders supported Paul and they confirmed his gospel and his work and they wrote a letter to all the churches proclaiming this and thus repudiating the Judaizers and their doctrine. That's how it was 
That's how it was settled. Notice one thing here, right? Uh, 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 the thing was settled with discussion. The apostles and the elders uh, you know, uh, uh, discussed it together, came to a conclusion, uh, uh, kind of put their conclusion in a letter and sent it out to the uh, churches and the Judaizers were, uh, you know, were repudiated here. One thing that didn't happen, you didn't see the Judaizers go off and start their own church. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> they at this point at least accept the, uh, accept the decision uh, of, the, uh, of the apostles and the elders. They submitted to that. All right, so Paul is now commenting on these events that took place and he comments on them in Galatians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 as he tells this story to the Galatians. So let's go to chapter, um, let's see, chapter 2. Uh, beginning in verse one and two, he says, then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. So he's telling the story, you know, what I've explained to you point by point. This is Paul's version of this in Galatians chapter two. So he's guided by the Lord to go and lay his case before the other apostles. The fear raised by the Judaizers in the minds of the Galatians was that all of Paul's work had been for nothing. He had run in vain because his gospel was not true. But Paul was laying it before the apostles themselves to show, it, uh, to show that his work was, you know, it was not for nothing. So we keep reading in verse three. It says, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Just one verse, but very important. He quickly demonstrates to the apostles that his work was not in vain because Titus, a Greek, was not required to be circumcised, even by the apostles in Jerusalem. So if the Judaizers were correct, and if the apostles sided with them, then the first one to be circumcised on that day would have been Titus, because he was a, he was a Greek. This was proof positive that the Judaizers' claims were groundless. In verse four and five he continues, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage but we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. So Paul did this, you know, report to the apostles. He did this because of the challenge of the Judaizers who wanted to restrict their freedom in Christ. They were the false brethren. Their purpose was to imprison the brethren with the law again. Paul did not give in to their demands so that they might remain free in Christ. You know, their demand was that Titus be circumcised as a test case for their position. And Paul refused and he stood his ground. Because if Titus wasn't circumcised in Jerusalem, well then nobody in Galatia would be circumcised either. That's the, that's the connection there. So Paul summarizes the outcome of the confrontation with the Judaizers and the meeting with the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem in verse six. He says, but from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. Sometimes you read that and you think, well, that's awfully, sounds arrogant, but that, that's not arrogance. He's just reporting what took place. Those who were reported to be of high reputation in comparison to Paul by the Judaizers. So you got to fill in the blanks there. They did not object to or add or subtract from the gospel that I presented. It wasn't Paul who was saying, I'm better than you, or it wasn't Peter that was saying, oh, we're better than you, Paul. The apostles in Jerusalem are higher than you, Paul. That, that, that's what the Judaizers were saying. They were saying, well, you know, we're, with the, we're with the headquarters you know, in Jerusalem and the apostles, and you know, they agree with us. You know, who's, this, who's this Paul guy? So Paul is responding, he says, For those who are of high reputation, that's not him who's saying that. According to the Judaizers, he says, you know, uh, who they are makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, all the apostles are all the apostles. 
Well, those who are of reputation, he says, contributed nothing to me. He's not saying they didn't help me. They, no, they did not add to my message. They did not add to my gospel. They didn't see things the way the Judaizers did. See, Paul considered himself and the other apostles as equal in the Lord's service. It was the Judaizers who tried to elevate one against the other. In God's sight, God makes no partiality between brethren based on name or reputation, position, so on and so forth. The apostles didn't do this, Paul didn't do this, it was the Judaizers who were sowing you know, division. Isn't that how you, you create division? You tell one guy, oh, you know, you're great, you're up there, that guy, he's lower than you, and so on and so forth. You know, I'll follow you because you're, you're better than the other. That's how, you, that's how you create division in any organization, especially in the church. In verse nine, he says, but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectively worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, effectively worked for me also to the Gentiles. So Peter and James and John gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship as a public witness of their solidarity of purpose and content of message. Isn't that what we do? You know when we encourage people, if they want to place memberships, just a way of saying that, what are we doing? We're extending the right hand of fellowship. They're saying we're new in town or we're new in this area, we're Christians, we were you know, having fellowship with this other congregation, now we live here, we'd like to have fellowship with this congregation, we extend the hand of fellowship. We could say these brethren, Mr. and Mrs. Smith and their two kids, they extend the hand of fellowship to us and we receive these brethren as our brethren as equal brothers in, in, and sisters in Christ Jesus, and all of us under the oversight of our elders. That, that's what's happening you know, when people quote place membership. A little bit what, what Paul is saying here. You know, the right, we receive the right hand of fellowship from the apostles. They recognized that Paul's apostleship and gospel had the very same source as their own. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles was encouraged and confirmed publicly, as was Peter and James and John, you know, Peter and, and the other apostles, not James, but Peter and the other apostles, um, uh, they, had the, they had a confirmation for their ministry. They concentrated on the Jews, uh, uh, Paul concentrated on the Gentiles. And then in the final verse of our section today, uh, he says, and recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So Paul is saying here that e they even agreed to share the work among the poor with the, uh, with the churches. And in verse 10 we read, it says, they only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. So not only did they give us the right hand of fellowship and accept us as you know, equal apostles with the same message, they even agreed to share the work among the poor within the churches. In this way, Paul demonstrates how his ministry and his message was confirmed by all the apostles and how the false gospel of the Judaizers had been rejected by the apostles in Jerusalem. All right, so this is how you know, he explains to the Galatians. Remember, no TV, no phone, no, you know, communication was very slow. So something, you, know, you could go to a region and, and spread the word on something and you know, unless there's someone else there to refute it, it stays, it, it becomes, the, you know, it becomes the, the truth. So this is why Paul is going to great pains to describe the process that he went through to receive confirmation from the other apostles that his apostleship was genuine and that his gospel was the same gospel that Peter was preaching in Jerusalem and not the message that was being brought to them by the Judaizers. All right, so next time we're going to see how Paul stood his ground on this principle even when Peter himself violated the principle of freedom in the gospel. A couple of lessons here, kind of simple lessons that I'd like to share with you on this particular section of Galatians. First one is, it's not, it's not who you know, it's what you preach. It's not who you know and who you are and how educated or how not educated you are. It's what you preach and teach that's important. 
God can raise up preachers from any race or social position and put the zeal of ministry into that person's heart. That's why, I mean, we're not in this situation now, right here in our congregation, but I tell churches, uh, I've had to preach for churches that were kind of you know, looking for ministers, if you wish, and I'd go in there and you know, kind of help out. This is why I tell churches looking for ministers, the most important qualification is knowledge of and faithfulness to and zeal for God's word. That's the number one qualification. A lot of times you know, people will hire a preacher after only hearing one of his sermons. Well, you know, there's a thing among preachers that we know, you know if you've been preaching for any, any, any amount of time, you know, you've got at least one good sermon in the file. There's got to be at least one that's good, right? Now, the best way to judge the preacher, the teacher, listen to his teaching. The content of his teaching, extremely important. Extremely important for those who are like hiring a minister because once you've hired him, you plan to have that minister for many, many years. So it's worth taking the time to review his body of work, not just to look for mistakes or things like that, but to see if he can go deep into the word, if he has a grasp and understanding of God's word, how to study it, how to share it, and certainly that he has a grasp of the gospel itself. Okay? So it's not who you know, it's what you preach. And then secondly, um, you can't grow as a church if we're more involved in arguing over the word than proclaiming it. You know, preaching is more important and fruitful than debating. We need to stay focused you know, on spreading the gospel and teaching what we know and are sure of than wasting time and energy debating and dividing over issues that don't affect salvation, don't affect our souls. You know, whether it's okay to clap or not to clap you know, when you're singing. Uh, certainly you know, there, there are arguments for both sides of that issue, but I've seen churches divide over such things. That's insanity. A lot of times churches kind of you know, lose their way and they start, you know, their, all of their emotional and spiritual energy goes into debating these kind of issues. And the, the preaching of the gospel and the teaching in order to edify and build up the church, that just kind of goes by the wayside because it's more exciting to get into a fist fight over a particular issue. And I won't mention the issues, you know, you know, what, I'm, you know what I'm talking about. You know, Jesus said, go into all the world and do what? Well, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He didn't say go and debate the brethren at the lectureships, <laughs> at the seminars. And I'm not against lectureships, seminars, they're good. They're, they're times that we can be fed and encouraged and, you know, build up one another in fellowship and so on and so forth. But a lot of times you know, we use those venues you know, to kind of just argue with each other and create animosity. I think a healthy church is usually a church that's busy preaching the gospel uh, to its community and uh, helping the brethren in the church to remain faithful and to grow in Christ. Okay, well that's the lesson for now. We're going to continue with our series on Galatians next time. Thank you for your attention.